we had to land on a secret runway in the heart of the Venezuelan jungle. We should have seen it already. If we continued, we wouldn't have enough fuel to return. Finally, we caught sight of it, right when we were deciding to turn back. The Colombian guerrilla who gave us the coordinates hadn't lied to us after all. These are the runways used by the drug traffickers. We are very close to the Colombian border, a very conflictive region because of the raids by the FARC, the Colombian guerrilla group, and because it is an area where cocaine is trafficked. Two large curiatas, or dugout canoes, awaited us. We got in the canoes and started to go up the Parucito River. These jungles are preserved in a pristine state. The fauna surprised us. We even saw tuna, river dolphins, which are almost extinct in the Oronoco River Basin. Nature was showing its strength. Problems would soon arise. The river was very low, and from time to time, we ran into large tree trunks that crossed the river, and now they were blocking our passage. We had to cut them with the power saw. Sometimes they were only slightly underwater, and we were forced to jump them fast, crashing against the riverbank before being able to stop ourselves. <laughs> Our goal was to make contact with the Hoti Indians, who live scattered along the headwaters of the Parucito. They are nomads, and they have never been filmed. We hope to find them. Three days into our journey, the water filters broke, and we had to drink water from the river. Our journey became one of non-stop hardships. We spent more time pulling the canoes than sailing in them. The river was infested with piranhas, electric rays, and poisonous stingrays, but the leeches were the worst. On the sixth day, we found a Hoti bridge. When these big trees fall, they tie them together with rails and vines to use them as bridges. Finally, we reached their territory. Now we just had to find them. It's the region of the large Tepuyes, the mesas that rise up from the jungle like true giants. They are sacred mountains for the indigenous people. For the next two days, we followed a footpath that led us to two large huts, but no one was there. We waited all day long until the afternoon when we finally saw a Hoti family arrive. They crossed a nearby stream walking on a tree trunk. They didn't seem too surprised to see us. Although friendly, they were unresponsive. Obviously, we were not the first men from the outside world that they had seen. The problem was communicating with them. At the most, there are about 200 Hoti left, and we couldn't find anyone who understood their language. At nightfall, we felt like we had traveled back through the tunnel of time. We had just landed in the Neolithic period, and we were witnessing our own prehistory. 
The Hoti own very few things, since they are nomads. A few pots and some machetes, which they exchange with neighboring tribes for meat and jungle skins. Some large baskets, and their weapons, blowpipes and spears. They live in family groups that are fairly distant from each other. They have never established large villages like other jungle tribes. Perhaps that's why they've remained isolated and deeply rooted in their customs. They are harder to find, even though there are religious groups like the New Tribes Mission, who fly over the jungle constantly in search of the last tribes in order to convert them to Christianity. They are perfectly adapted to their environment. They don't know any other world beyond these thousand-year-old jungles. They use an infinite number of medicinal remedies obtained from plants. They are hunters and gatherers, and they feel they are just another jungle species. It's quite clear, of course, that they reign over the rest because of their intelligence. The men hunt and the women gather. Food is shared among everyone. They move to a new place when there is no game left, or they feel stalked by the felines but they do not travel farther than 50 or 60 kilometers. There are very few ethnographic studies about the Hoti. The first reference to the Hoti only dates back to 1913. Indirectly, some Yekwanas told a story to a Catholic missionary about the existence of a group of wild natives who lived in a territory delimited by the Caura, Erebato, and Bentauri river basins. The first scientific research was carried out in 1961 by the anthropologist Cruchent, who made contact for the first time with a group of 14 individuals who still used stone axes. The last study was carried out by Walter Coppins in 1976, since then, there have only been sporadic encounters like the one we were experiencing now. Honey is the delicacy of the jungle. The Hoti go out to harvest it periodically. They walk long distances until they find a tree with honeycombs. First, they build a fire in the place where they estimate that the treetop will fall. Then they start to fell it. The smoke bewilders the bees and makes them less aggressive. Without any other kind of protection, they make holes in the branches with the axes and extract the rich nectar. Despite the smoke, they get stung quite a lot, but they're used to it. They also believe that the venom makes them stronger, which makes some sense. In some European countries, apitoxine, the main agent in bee venom, is beginning to be used as a component of anti-allergy and anti-arthritis medicines. They harvest and consume all the edible substances from the beehives, honey, larvae, and pollen. They even use the wax to make torches. Nacho Caro, one of our cameramen, films them. He's well protected from the bees, three pairs of pants, three sweatshirts, and a double layer mosquito net. The bees don't sting him, yet he was about to dehydrate. The jungle provides them with everything they need. They use a wide variety of plant fibers to build their huts and to make hammocks to sleep in, some of their clothes, and baskets to carry their belongings when they move. 
They make the powerful curare, which they spread on their darts, turning them into lethal weapons. Even the largest prey, like the tapir, the vaquero, or the bare-necked umbrella bird, fall dead shortly after being hit by the poisonous hoti darts. Flutes made from bones or reeds are the only musical instruments they play. Their melodies are very primitive. Before we start our journey back, we show them some of the footage we filmed, something we'll do with many of the nomadic peoples we're going to visit. We want to see their reactions. They are a mysterious people of uncertain origin. They are known as the Men of Oxen. They wander the African Sahel Strip. They are the Pils, also known as the Fulani or the Fulbe. Their life is an eternal journey in search of pasture lands and water for their livestock. They only subject themselves to the codes of traditional law in which honor and hospitality are the main precepts. After several weeks of seasonal migration, today an entire clan reaches one of their regular settlements. These reunions take place three or four times a year. Today, about six million Fulani live in Africa. The women arrive wearing their very best clothes. They carry the family ornamental gourds on their heads, which is the symbol of wealth. Their faces are adorned with old silver coins, their best jewels, and we can see their clan tattoos, which distinguish them from other tribes. Many of these tattoos are identity marks whose origin dates back to the period of the slave trade. If they were to be captured, they could recognize members of their own clan in distant lands. The pool home is very simple and easy to build. With a circular layout, the roof is made from palm leaves and the walls from mats. Inside, in addition to the ramshackle bed for sleeping, the gourds occupy a preferential place. As is customary in Africa, our arrival caused a great commotion. And as always, the parliament lasted for hours until everyone agreed to let us film.
You have to be very patient. You can't bypass any member of the hierarchy. You have to let them all talk so that no one feels disrespected. We would later return to learn more about these people, especially the Bororo Pils tribe. When the sun began to set and the temperatures dropped from the 45 degrees centigrade at midday, the drum began to sound and the ambiance became invigorated. The Fulani slave women started to dance. They are the descendants from inferior castes, which even today are still subject to the plans of the noble Fulani class. Their feline bodies evolved to the sound of the percussion in sinuous movements overflowing with sensuality. The magic of Africa runs through their veins. Their movements are powerfully hypnotic, making you delve into deep age-old Africa. You simply let yourself be carried away. Santi Vega, our musician and composer, could not resist the temptation to play with them. He became intoxicated by the rhythm of the African drums. We are now in the north of Mongolia. Our goal is to reach the Tsateng, the reindeer herdsmen who live between the north of Mongolia and the south of Siberia. We are encountering problems. It's springtime, the only season in which travel is possible, when the steps have defrosted, but the rivers are still frozen. Since there are no bridges, crossing the water is possible. The temperatures, however, have risen, and the frozen surface is not safe to travel over. We've crossed five rivers, and on the last one, one of the cars got stuck between the water and the ice. Upon reaching the next river, we were forced to continue on horseback since the ice was not safe anymore. We decided to send two of our Mongol assistants ahead of us in order to find the Tsatang. We don't know exactly where their campsite is. They can move much faster than we can. We're about an eight-day journey on horseback from the Taiga, where the Tsatang usually are during this period. Before leaving Ulaanbaatar, my cameraman Alberto Moro and I bought some foxskin hats to protect us from the cold and the only sunglasses that we could find, a Russian brand that was in style 30 years ago, although still very useful. We traveled on horseback with 23 horses, in the afternoon, the temperatures dropped to 25 below zero and the blizzard began. When dawn broke, a wonderful day appeared and the sun warmed things up. 
This would be the routine of our expedition. Sun in the morning and blizzard and cold in the afternoon and at night. By the third day, we reached an ovo, a small sanctuary where the spirits live. And to our surprise, a Tzatang traveling alone appeared. Our Mongol companions made an offering to the spirits before continuing our journey. It's customary for travelers to offer the spirits a lock of hair from their horse's mane or some object to protect them during their travels. Now we were being guided by Kambalat, our new Tzatang friend. Shortly afterwards, we reached the taiga. We left the large grasslands behind as we entered the northern forest of conifers, the largest green lung on the planet. Upon reaching another ovo, Kambalat told us that his campsite was very close by. We had reached our destination. The Tsatang live in chums, tents that look like the teepees of North American Plains Indians. They are very simple, a structure of sticks covered with canvas or deer skin. These chums protect them from the 40 degree below zero temperatures in the winter and the 40 degree above zero in the summer. Despite the reputation for being savages, which was believed until just a few years ago, they are a friendly and hospitable people. Their habitat is very remote and they spend six months completely isolated by the snow, which forces them to be self-sufficient. They live completely from deer. Each family has a herd of 40 or 50 animals. During the summer, they stock up on firewood, sun-dried meat, and everything else they will need to survive the harsh winter months. The inside of the chum is presided over by a heater stove, and most of their time is spent around it. From milking in the morning, they spend all day attending to their deer. They are very strong animals, but their hoofs are very fragile. When they walk on arid ground, they often hurt themselves, and sometimes these wounds get infected and are hard to treat. Women are responsible for the household chores. They melt the snow to store the day's water and make cheese and yogurt. The men attend to the livestock and hunt during the warm months. They move up to eight times a year in search of suitable pastures and lands for their deer. The Tsatang were subject to collectivization following the Soviet Revolution. In 1930, their deer were expropriated in the name of the state. Many preferred to kill them before handing them over. It seemed like the end of their nomadic life. But the fall of the Soviet Union gave them back their freedom. The Tsatang have always interested travelers. In the Book of Wonders by Marco Polo, we can read his description of them. They are very wild people who live on the animals they catch. But the most extraordinary thing is how they train large deer and ride them like horses. We also showed the Tsatang our footage before our departure. We are at 5,249 meters above sea level in Qinghai province in Chinese Tibet. As tradition calls for in these places, we made an offering to the goddess of the mountain. We deposited a yellow parakeet in the offertory. The goddess would protect us on our journey towards the Kamba nomads of Tibet. We found them in the valleys close to the city of Yushu. They are the nomads found at the top of the world, easily recognizable thanks to their black tents made from yak hair 
crowned by the strands of printed prayers on white fabric. They are the so-called wind horses, which flutter with the gusts of air in eternal prayer. Just as the tzatang live on deer, the kambas totally depend on their yaks. They get milk from the yaks to make butter, yogurt, and cheese, and get nourishment from their meat, whether fresh or sun-dried. They braid ropes and fabric with yak hair for their tents, which are waterproof, although light passes through the knots. Yak tendons are used as tents. The Kambas are profoundly religious. Before starting their daily activities, the families come together to pray in front of a sacred tanka, a cloth with paintings of saints and deities, and with mandalas, the maps of the Buddhist cosmos. The traditional hairstyle of the Kamba women consists of 108 braids smeared with dry butter from the female yak. The number 108 is sacred and symbolizes the Buddhist deity Shakti, the mother of the world. The ends of the braids are joined all together. Then they fasten some leather strips to their hair with amber and turquoise from the Baltic area and fossilized coral from the Tethys Ocean. The tent rooftops open so that the smoke can be ventilated and to regulate the temperature in summer. The women cook in the mud fireplace, which they build on one side of the room. They use dung from the livestock as fuel. At this height, getting firewood is not possible. During the warmer months, they fill the storeroom with provisions for the winter, mainly yak meat, cheese, and butter. They also store barley. Once it's made into flour and toasted, it's mixed with milk, tea, and yak lard to make tsampa the staple food of Tibet. Despite the extreme cold of the high Tibetan plateau, it's quite comfortable inside the tents. The families are quite large. They practice polyandry. All the brothers can share the same wife. Thus, the children are common to all, and this way they avoid having to share the livestock. The children call the oldest brother father, and the other brothers uncle. They move up to ten times a year. Their tents are easy to dismantle. Sometimes several families come together to help each other take down the tents and be better protected against pests and bandits during their travels. They use the largest yaks to carry the heaviest loads. After several hours of work, wrapping their belongings, the caravan sets out towards their new enclave where they will assemble their tents and settle for a period of time that lasts no more than two months. We see barley crops in every valley, especially those close to the monasteries. The Tibetan monks eat practically only tsampa. They prepare it in a deep bowl and knead portions of it in the shape of balls. Once they are eaten with water or tea, they swell in the stomach, producing the sensation of being satisfied. At least one member of each Kamba family enters the monastery to become a monk. Many no 
nomads make pilgrimages to the temples in the city of Yushu. The prayer wheels do not stop turning all day. Before Buddhism reached Tibet, the Bon religion was practiced, based on shamanic practices. Buddhism blended with these beliefs, bringing about Lamaism. Today, the Bon tradition is only practiced on the sacred Mount Kailash. According to their beliefs, all animals have a soul and should therefore be treated with the greatest respect. When they kill their yaks, they perform a special little ceremony using some of the water that has been blessed by monks from the monastery. Then they bind the animal's muzzle firmly and slowly suffocate it. If they killed it faster, its soul would not have time to fly free. Prayers are murmured throughout the death ritual. The sacred conch makes the call to prayer three times a day from the heights of the Yego Gompa Monastery, the biggest in the city of Yushu. Before our departure, we bring a white parakeet to the temple as a symbol of respect and gratitude for their allowing us to film here. Here we are in the forbidden land of Arlet in Northern Australia. This is Aboriginal territory. The countryside is spattered with millions of clay stalagmites, huge termite nests forming a landscape that is unique in the world. The unending sound of the didgeridoo takes us into the magical world of dreams, into the indigenous mythology in which the rainbow serpent created the world. for us, problems as usual. We're traveling in a 10-ton motorhome, and crossing rivers can sometimes take hours. Ahead of us, there's 2,000 kilometers of mud, which is going to become an absolute nightmare. In Kakadu National Park, we find the Ubirak settlement, where the rainbow serpent stopped after creating the world. From time immemorial, the age-old Aborigine people decorated the rocky walls with a whole series of images depicting their way of life and belief systems. They painted the animals they hunted or fished. Many of these animals are the same that today's Aborigines hunt and fish for. Baramundi fish, long-necked turtles, kangaroos, 
crocodiles, and wallabies. On these ancient rocks, they also portrayed the figures of the men of those times, the warriors and hunters, who used the same spears and harpoons that they use nowadays. In one protected spot, we find a depiction of the rainbow serpent, to whom they pay special homage. The Aborigines have a profound knowledge of nature. They find practically everything they need in the forests. They make their own weapons and tools. Harpoons and spears are still used often. They heat flexible stems to straighten and harden them. Then they strip off the bark and cut them into the right size for the men who will be using them. Different tips are added depending on what use the sticks will be put to. If they're for fishing, they're usually tipped with a trident to make a catch easier. Today, the tips are made of iron, which they've got from construction materials. When the tide is low, they fish for dangerous stingrays. They're rays which lie camouflaged in the sand, with their poisonous sting ready for action at the slightest threat. Once the ray has been harpooned, the first move is to remove its sting. Although dying, the ray is still very dangerous. Stingrays are a real delicacy. The skin is taken off and the raw flesh collected. This is then macerated in clay and spices. The women are in charge of harvesting. When a major festival is approaching, they go out in search of honey. Their work method is the same as what we saw among Venezuela's Hoti Indians, except that in this case, there's no need to create a fire in order to stupefy the bees with the smoke. These bees are harmless. Today, most Aborigines live in prefabricated houses, which are a far remove from their traditional way of life. There are hardly any remaining nomadic Aborigines. In 1931, the land of Arnhem in Northern Australia was declared an Aboriginal reservation. And in the 1967 constitution, the Aborigines were given equal rights with white people. But there was a catch. The land now belonged to them, but whites still had the right of use and they continue to mine the natural resources. In exchange, each Aborigine receives a small monthly wage. It's an effective way to kill off their culture. They don't have to work, hunt, or fish. With these traditional focuses eliminated, alcohol has been wreaking absolute havoc. The Aborigines' traditional weapon is the boomerang. It's a highly effective weapon which the hunters use to bring down major prey. 
Contrary to popular belief, a real boomerang doesn't come back to its thrower. The tourism industry puts out souvenirs that do a great job of coming back, but they're not actually boomerangs. The right weight and curvature, which is what adds to precision and manageability, are essential. The women also search the forests for food. They fish with hooks and lines in the brooks. During the dry season, they make traps to capture crustaceans and small fish. Their main activity is the gathering of fruits, roots, and tubers, mainly wild yams. The sacred instrument of the Aborigines is the didgeridoo. With it, they communicate with the great beyond, with dream time. It is not made like other musical instruments. Instead, they search for it in the woods. They clean and decorate it. The didgeridoo is made by ants. Northern Australia is the kingdom of ants. There are hundreds of thousands of termites. In some areas, experts have calculated that there could be as many as 20 million termites per hectare. The termites also invade trees, especially eucalyptus trees. They eat away at them from within, although they never in fact kill the trees entirely. To find a didgeridoo, the men go into the woods and test the eucalyptus trees. According to how hollow they sound when tapped, the men know whether the ants have finished their excavation work. Then they clear out any wood dust and termite excrement by putting a hot iron bar into the branch. Finally, they test it for sound. During the night, the sounds of the didgeridoo waken the rainbow serpent. Dancing produces an altered state of consciousness, which allows people to enter dream time. Aboriginal art is extremely sought after on the international market. In his work, each painter tries to depict certain dreams which belong to him. But if he wants to illustrate the dreams of another person, he must ask permission. Through dreams, they gain access to that other parallel world in which, since the time of creation, gods, spirits, and men have lived together. Their actions there are what modify and affect the world of the living. Painting merges past and present and enables man to connect with the beyond. These days, most use commercial materials like watercolors and oils on canvas and frames, but some still continue to do their work using natural pigments painted onto tree bark. Dots, circles, crosses, and spirals symbolize places and pathways within dreams. They are a kind of religious map. The artists also depict dreams related to fantastical beings. Other paintings portray totemic animals, fish, crocodiles, turtles, duck-billed platypi, kangaroos, serpents, pictures which are inspired by the ancient drawings painted on sacred rocks.
The turtle is a totemic animal, perhaps because it has always formed part of the people's staple diet. Every part of the turtle is used. Its flesh and its eggs are highly prized as delicious foodstuffs, while the shell is used to make several kinds of utensils. During the reproductive season, they search for the places where the turtles have laid their eggs and collect them by the hundreds. It's forbidden, but it still goes on. Nowadays, many Aborigines have modern fishing instruments, but they still use traditional harpoons to hunt animals like manatees or giant turtles. The capture of a giant turtle is cause for celebration in the community. First, they make a special fire and heat stones. Once hot, these are placed inside the shell, together with herbs and spices, and the long cooking process begins. Everyone joins in the feasting until there is nothing but the shell left. By night, the didgeridoo sounds again and the dancing begins. They give thanks to the Dreamtime spirits for the capture of a giant turtle. These people have lived in these lands singing and dreaming of the creation for 40,000 years. A philosophy of life which, despite external pressures, seems to be in no danger of disappearing.